guys for those uh, beautiful recitations. Uh, just as a quick introduction, uh, our uh, guest speaker of the night, um, Brother Walid is the executive director of the Michigan chapter of the Council on American Islamic Relations, a chapter of America's largest advocacy and civil liberties organization for Muslims. He's also a preacher of Islamic faith, delivering sermons at Islamic centers across America, and is a political blogger for the Detroit News. He's spoken at more than 30 institutions of higher learning about Islam and interfaith dialogue, including DePaul University, Harvard University, and the University of the Virgin Islands. He's presented on prominent panel discussions with international leaders and academics, including the 2008-2011 Congressional Black Caucus Conventions and the 2009 and 2010 Malian Peace and Tolerance Conferences held in Bamako, Mali, which were attended by religious scholars from 12 different countries. Um, in 2008, uh, Mr. Woody delivered the closing benediction at the historic 52nd Michigan Electoral College in the Michigan State Senate Chambers and gave the baccalaureate speech for graduates of the prestigious Cranbrook Kingswood Academy located in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. And um, so yeah, we're honored to have you here for tonight. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, thumma alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, adada ma fi al-samawati wal-ard. Wa afdul salati wa tawwa tislimi ala sayyidina wa nabiyyina wa habibina wa azimina maulana Muhammadin wa ala alihi al-tahirin wa sahbihi al-mukhlisin wa tistabi'inu ahu bi khairan wa isanan ila yum al-deen wa amma ba'du. Brothers and sisters, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here with you on this blessed night, Lil Jum'ah, uh, this best night of the week for dua. And uh, before I get into the topic, just remind you of two things that this night, if you can, it's very uh, recommended that we read Surah uh, Al-Kaf, tonight if possible, the 18th chapter of the Quran, in which there are many lessons in that chapter, and also we were told by our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that we should increase sending this Salat upon him on this night and on Yom Al-Jum'ah day, and the best way that we do it is to do it the way that he taught us to do it in the authentic hadith, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad. That's, that's the way he taught us. This is the best durood or the best salat ala nabi. We should do it the way that he taught us to say it. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad, which we say in our prayers. Um, I've been given the topic to discuss about how we can identify and work to overcome in our community the issue of racism. And uh, I applaud you for having this forum. I believe on a macro level, and I was speaking with Sister earlier, that there are four issues that our community needs to discuss over and over again constantly that are brushed underneath the rug, that are really holding us back from what we're supposed to be both spiritually as well as from a social political perspective. Those four are racism, misogyny, classism, and sectarianism. Those are the four diseases that are holding us back as a community. Islam came to do away with those things, but just as they existed in the time of the Sahaba, and they had to go through a purification process, we are very far removed from the Sahaba. So if they had those issues and they were battling with those issues, that you know is an issue for us that we have to deal with. Now, racism as a term, and I'm going to define this term because many of us don't even understand what the term racism is from a sociological perspective. Racism is not just individual bias or individual prejudice. Racism is prejudice plus power. Racism is prejudice plus power. So an individual can make a biased remark towards someone, and it may hurt their feelings. 
But if a person is in a privileged group or in a group that is seen to be or perceived to be higher than another based upon racial hierarchy, then there are negative consequences for the one who is subjected to the prejudice, where conversely, the person who's in a position of weakness can say something to another person who's in a position of strength in the, in, in the hierarchy, but it may not really affect them. It may not marginalize them socially as being a Muslim. And we're talking specifically and focusing on racism within the Muslim community. Now, the term racism, as we understand today, or as it said in the Arabic language, al ansariyah did not exist in the time of the Prophet This term didn't exist. Racism exists, but the term didn't exist. The term that we are given that's the closest in classical Arabic is, kept, is called al asabiyah al asabiyah as we see, translated as tribalism of the Ta'asul of sticking to, uh, like, strongly sticking to one group to the exclusion of dealing with others. This is Ta'asub or related to Al-Asubiyah. So if you read in Sunan uh, Abi Dawood, in a good tradition, or when I say good, uh, Hadith Hassan, Hadith Hassan. And we all should know what these different Hadith are, Hadith Sahih, Hadith Hassan, Hadith Ta'if. Basically, the Hadith, we can summarize in three different, this is Hadith Marfu'a, and this is Hadith Hassan. So Sahaba said to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, Mal Asabiyah, or Ma Al Asabiyah, Mal Asabiyah. They wanted to know the definition because our Prophet said, leave Asabiyah because it is rotten. He said, leave it, it's rotten, like it stinks, like a dead corpse, it's rotten. So the Sahaba, Ya Rasulullah, Mal Asabiyah. So he said, Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi wa Sallam, and Tu'ina Kawma Ka'lu Fulu. Okay? It means that you aid your people, you aid your problem, you aid your group in oppressing or wrongdoing. So this is the closest thing or definition that we have of the tribalism. Now we know that God, Allah Azza wa Jal, made us to be different. He didn't mean for all of us to be the same. We have a verse in the Quran, right? It says, and the differences between the night and the day, and the differences between your skin colors and your tongues. You know, there are signs, right? We have the ayah of the Quran that all of us know, Surah Al-Hujurat, right, the 13th verse. Ya ayyuhal nas, na khalaqana kum min dhakran hunza. Right? O people, surely we created you from a male and female and made you into various nations and tribes that you may get to know one another. See? So in this ayah, there's a philosophy in this ayah. Allah Azza wa Jal starts off with you. And that's, this means all of humankind. Okay, this is our starting point. This is our universal point. And and that's, it, it was created by El Khalaq. So this is all in the ayah, right? So God is the creator, he's one, and he created us first. Our first identity is en -Nas. And then he said he made us into different nations. So en is greater, or en akbaru min right? So the nation, I mean all people, Humankind is greater or bigger than one particular shah or one nation, right? So it says shu'ub, so, so it's nations. Then we have something that's even smaller and to a degree has less strength than the nation. See, and that's the, that's the qabila, that's the individual tribe of qabail or qabila, see? This is the philosophy of this ayah. Our human identity under our creator is supposed to be the most important identity. Okay? Then our nation, and then our little tribal affiliations or tribal hookup. Like how the Sahaba did. They had Bani Aus, and Bani Khazraj, and Bani Hashim, and all these. Bani, and uh, you had that one tribe that uh, rebelled, uh, Bani uh, Koreba, all these different tribes. This is the lesser, like affiliation. 
You see? Now, relating back to racism, and we're talking about like God, Allah Azza wa Jalla has given us these different identities. It's healthy that we have these different identities. But we as Muslims, when we begin to view ourselves or our little tribe, or our little nation, within the construct of hierarchy, that one group is better than the other, or that we affirm that one particular group has more privilege than another, then we are going into racism which is structural in nature. Who was the original racist? I'm asking you a question. We'll go back and forth because we're going to have a Q&A. Who was the original racist? And we're talking about from a, from, a, from a position of power. Who had the power and what structure was in place when the original racist manifests himself? Is it he, not a she? Iblis, la'atullahi alayhi. Iblis. Allah Azza wa Jal said, I created the jinn nor the, nor the men, illa li ya'budun, except for my worship. So jinn were here before men. And Iblis was the leader, because we had angels that were created, jinn, then men. So Iblis was the leader. And when Allah said that he was going to make a khalifa in the earth, our father Adam, alayhi salam, before Allah blew the ruh, blew some of the ruh in the Adam, alayhi salam, and Allah Azza wa Jal, we know, commanded all of the malaika to prostrate. And all of them did, did illa iblis. Except iblis. And then what did he say when he was asked? I'm better than him because you made me a fire, you made him a clay. So iblis. Look at a physical characteristic. First, he was a leader and felt like he was better and he had more privilege or more right to lead, number one, because he was in a leadership position. Then number two, he thought that his time being or his time in existence made him superior. And I'm getting to a point now, because keep in mind I'm talking about the Muslim community. He was here first, he was worshiping Allah first before Adam. So then he thought this made him better too. Then the third is, he thought that he was made of a stronger constitution. Because he was made of fire, and we think of fire as being stronger than clay. And, it's a, and the jinn are made of a special type of fire, by the way. The jinn are made of a fire that's free of smoke. You know, if you burn something, right? If you throw some paper into a fire and it burns, what you see, the smoke, is actually the impurities coming up from what's being burned. So he thought his stuff didn't stink, right? He thought he had no impurities. He thought he was talking. See, he thought that he was pure. Or matsu. You see? So he had an arrogance in his mind, right? So Allah Azza wa Jal talks about him that he was istakbar, is the word used in the Quran. It's a different type of word than kibar. Like in Arabic, kibar means arrogant, right? Istakbar means something else. Like, like, like if we say istakbar, istakbar, right? We're seeking maghfirah, we're seeking forgiveness. Istakbar, istakbar in Arabic means, or Quranic Arabic, literally means that he sought to make himself bigger than what he really was. He sought to make himself more important than what he really was. This is the mind of the races. This is the mind of the races. And the original racist was Iblis, and many scholars have said this. So now we're talking about uh, racism in, in the Muslim community. It can manifest itself in a number of ways. And what I really want to focus on is not overt racism as far as name calls. This is, this, is not, this is not the major problem in the community. I'm sure many of you, though, you saw that campaign I started last year for a little while about drop the A-word campaign, about saying, about stopping the usage of the word Aki. How many of you know about that campaign? I don't know. 
Alhamdulillah, it was successful. It raised awareness, right? So, okay. Some people do call people uh, racial slurs or bad names, but that's not the only one. There's there's several of them. They're not labeled just say black people. They can even be labeled or leveled at people within the same ethnic group, even based upon skin color, right? So that happens, that takes place. But I want to focus more on, in the language of sociology, racism that manifests itself in, in microaggression. How many of you have heard this term microaggression before? Okay, alhamdulillah, so I don't have to define it. It's, it's, go there, it saves time. So, but what we see microaggression is in two forms that we see a lot in our community. So the one is what is called micro-assault. So micro-assault can be verbal, but as well as non-verbal, right? Like for instance, let's say that someone comes into a masjid, and they're of a different ethnicity group or a different, uh, yeah, different ethnicity group, because race is really a man-made construct. That's why even the term Sharia is a, a racism, the term in Arabic is a new term because really race is a man-made construct. A thousand years ago, there was no like construct of race as exists today. These were European anthropologists who constructed this concept of race. We have mongoloid and caucasoid, negroid, this stuff. This is, this is a European uh, intention. Okay, but we're talking about racism for so for the sake of this conversation we will we may go back and forth and use this term. Okay? So an act of microaggression is that when someone comes into a masala and comes for prayer time, and then the akama is called, and then the person goes and stands to get in the soft or the line. Then, if that person from a different ethnic group are darker, then the other people there, no one wants to go and stand next to the person praying. That's a, that's a type of, of, of micro-assault. It happens. It's happened to me before. No, it happens. It's called micro-assault. Another form of micro-assault that is offensive and hurts people, and by the way, we talk about microaggression. Sometimes micro, uh, the microaggression, as far as racism, may not even be in the top of the consciousness. See, it's in the subconscious, because the racism is so sat saturated, it's so deep that it, that it expresses itself in subtle manners, or subtle ways. So, uh, man, uh, yeah, in subtle uh, ways. So another one is, someone comes into a room, and everyone there speaks English fluently, and comes in. And then when a person comes and sits amongst a group of people, then the other group of people then flip or turn and start speaking another language, excluding the person. That's a form of micro-assault. That's micro-aggression. You know, this is, this is wrong in the Quran, by the way. In the Quran, it says, in the manajwa mina shaitan. Secret counsels are from the devil. Okay? And we look at the tafsir of this, it said that if there's a group of three people, and that there's, if there's two people, and there's, and they're specifically trying to leave out a third person who comes into a group for discussion, this is in Nejwa. This is a secret council. So a person can be right there with you, but there are two people who are speaking over a person in another language, yet all three of you know the same language, but you flip the script to try to like talk about your discussion, knowing you're leaving the other person out, that's microaggression. That's a microassault. I see this happen all the time too. Now what's funny is when people start doing this and not knowing I understand Arabic and they start speaking and talking about me. I say, I'm going to call it in the Also, micro invalidation. Micro invalidation is when someone has concerns 
or someone brings up issues where they feel hurt or they feel like they see a problem going on relating to racism in general, but we'll keep the racism. Then the script gets flipped where one, the person's feelings are invalidated. The person is told, stop being so sensitive. Why do you see it that way? Right? Or the other one is the script is flipped where the person who is doing the racism or part of a group that's higher than the other in the racial hierarchy then accuses the other person of being racist. See? So then if you call out racism and you bring up the issue, oh, you're being a racist. Oh, you've hurt my feelings. Oh, you talked about the people being racist. Oh, you hurt my feelings. I, I'm not a racist. You know, anytime you're somewhere and you have to tell people you're not a racist, you might have a problem. You might be a racist. Right? You see? Like, I don't go around saying I'm not a terrorist. Like, when I do interviews and stuff, or people try to accuse me, I'm not going to even dignify a comment because I know I'm not a terrorist. I say, oh, I'm not a terrorist. Like, what am I going to say that for? I already know. Like, why have I defend myself about that? So someone said, oh, yeah, that's not kind of racist. Oh, you know, oh, I didn't mean, oh, I'm not a racist. You know, that's something you might have to take a look at. You see? So that's another form of of, of microaggression uh, uh, that takes place. Another form of microaggression that takes place is actually can happen with people within the same ethnic group or the same so-called racial group if they have friends of another racial or ethnic group or if they're interested in marrying someone with another ethnic or racial group, then they can be victimized or they can be a victim of microaggressive racism by their own people. So if someone, for instance, one Muslim is hanging around another Muslim of another group, another, oh, uh, why are you hanging around such and such? Or then trying to imitate or talk like another group of people using another type of accent. Or, or, or saying, oh, oh yeah, oh yeah, you're, you're hanging out with such and such. Or as, as I start calling you like a name based upon a particular food that a stereotypical or a particular group eats. Or if one person then wants to go and interested in marrying someone outside of their ethnic or racial group, then you have the microaggression bullying and say, oh, why do you want to do that? Or I, have a, or, or I know of an instance of a brother uh, who I know who, uh, I was mentoring this African American who married a sister who was Pakistani American, and people in the community were calling up her mom being microaggressive. You see, they were saying, "Oh, we know you want to have beautiful grandchildren. They're going to come out dark. You know, they're going to come out fair. Fair is a problematic word too, because fair means like good in English. So what? So dark skin is unfair." Like, what's up with that? Like, we shouldn't even be using that term, fair, like, fair and love and skin. You see? That was one. Then the other one was, oh, every, all the girls respect your daughter. Now, if she marries this black guy, and all of our daughters want to marry black guys. Like, it's jungle fever. Like, they want to catch the flu. And everybody who's Pakistani in the community is going to want to marry a, a black Muslim dude. Like, it doesn't work that way, right? That's, that's microaggression. So these things take place in our community. And also another form is the alienation we have, or also tokenization. There's alienization and tokenization are also forms of microaggression. So alienate, alienate, uh, so someone's being alienated is that Someone comes to a particular masjid, right? And there's a dominant ethnic group. But then, regarding activities or leadership, the person is never allowed or never can be in any type of leadership position or head any committee because they're not part of this particular clique. Or they're not part of this particular ethnic group. 
Or sometimes it gets down to, like in, like in a couple of Massachusetts, or some of the Massachusetts and Dearborn, they're not from the right village. You see, because, you know, we're from Gaza, we're the people from Beta Hanina. You know, see, that's how, it's, you know, how the, or, uh, or we're from Bentish Bay, we're the people from Tipney. You see? We're from Dimash, we don't like those people from Halab. Whatever. Like it plays itself out in different ways. This is micro uh, aggressive behavior. Or also the tokenization, right? Where you have the, the new convert that comes in, and then you or you have two different converts that come in, right? So then the one guy he comes in and he's a white convert, he's a Muslim for five days, you'll make him an assistant imam. <laughs> no, but we have to think about what is driving this mentality. I'm serious. This stuff is happening. Sheikh Hamza Yusuf has talked about this stuff before. I mean, this is no secret. The black guy and the white guy convert at the same time, and then the white guy gets invited to come to dinner, and then a week later, they want to make him an assistant email. They'll put him on the board of directors. And then the black guy didn't get invited to anybody's house for any dinner. You know you can get invited to, to marry anybody's daughter. You know that. You see? This is, this is all microaggressive. What are, what are some solutions? I have some, I have some solutions here to these problems, but I want to have, I'll, I'll wrap up so we can have discussion on this. The, the most important is muhasabah, muhasabah. So we have to do self-calculation. And muhasabah is basically check yourself before you wreck yourself, as my friend Jake uh, Subhaib Webb says, you got to check yourself before you wreck yourself. This is al-muhasibah. This is self-calculation. We have to check ourselves. We have to, do a, we have to do an inventory on ourselves. We have to look into our hearts and our minds that when we deal with each other, do we see ourselves or see our group as being better than another group? Are we automatically suspicious of other people just because their parents are from a different origin, or their skin color is lighter, or their skin color is darker, or their hair texture is different. We have to check ourselves about this constantly. You see, Ibn Qayyim al Jawziya, he relates, and this is serious, he relates the Ta'asab, the Asabiya, we can say racism, he relates it to a type of shirk. Because when you, when, when you make fun of people or put other people down, you are actually rebelling against God because God is the one who created people to be different. When we mock Allah as a Wajal's creation, this is a major transgression. See, we have to look at ourselves. When we have these thoughts in our hearts and our minds, we have to say being racist is just as haram as eating a pork chop sandwich or drinking a 40 ounce. Being racist, and I'm talking about microaggressive ways. I'm not talking about just calling someone a bad name. Microaggressive racism is just as haram in Islam than if you eat some khanzir or drink khamr. That's the way we should look at it. So we have to constantly check ourselves. Number two is that recognizing these forms of microaggression that we talk about and try to avoid them when we see ourselves potentially slipping into those, and I just named some, uh, I named a number of examples. The third is, we have to have moral courage. You see, we have to be able to confront people that we see perpetuating racism, both overtly and in forms that are microaggressive, which includes calling out publicly if need be. I have an example of this. See, some people criticized me for the Twitter campaign I did. I was retweeting people, saying racist stuff, saying, oh, why didn't you say something to the person in private? Isn't that Siha in private? Not always. This is, a, this is a misunderstanding of Sharia. Not always. I will give you hadith mashur, sahih. It's famous story. There's a lot of lessons in it. A disagreement between two of the beautiful campaigns. Beautiful campaigns. 
What was Abu Dhar al Ghifari? The other one was Sayyidu Mu'adineen Bilal ibn Rabah. Abu Dhar was from Bani Ghifar, Arab tribe. So there was a day Abu Dhar got upset with Bilal about something. And he said to Bilal, Ya ibn Sauda, O oh, you son of a black woman. Now what's interesting about this hadith is this. Before we go further, we need to understand who was Abu Dhar and who was Bilal. Interestingly, if you read like the, the descriptions of the Sahaba, like Ibn Sa'ad and the Tabari, you'll see that Abu Dhar is described as Kana, Abu Dhar, Al Jafari, Tawilan, Asmarullah. So he was tall and he had brown skin. He was what you would consider a black Arab, like Ana Asmar. In Arabic language, I'm brown. I'm not black, according to, to the understanding of Arabic language. My skin is not black. My teacher, Sheikh Ali Suleiman Ali, the Imam of Kenton Masjid, he's Aswad. He's black. And an Aswad. You see? So he was, he was black. He was a black Arab. And there are many black Arabs, if you read, like Ahmad ibn Yasser, Ali ibn Abi Talib. Like, there's a number of them. If you read their uh, sifa or their physical characteristics, they were black Arabs. Okay? Or they'd be considered modern day terms. Bilal was darker. Abu Dhab's mother was a free woman. Bilal's mother had been a slave woman, Habashia from Ethiopia. That was also interesting about this. Many of us call him Bilal al Habashi, Bilal the Abyssinian, Bilal the Ethiopian. People call him that, right? We call him that, right? But Bilal's father was an Arab. So according to Arab custom, if someone's father was an Arab, we're supposed to consider him an Arab. Somehow or another, we call him Bilal al Habashi. But Bilal's father, Rabah, was an Arab. He came from an Arab tribe. He had been enslaved, he's an Arab. So I just want to throw that out there. So anyway, he said, oh, you son of a black woman. So Abu Dhar was dark, and I was darker. Bilal had, with the hadith, for some said he was Hazan Shadid. You see? He was grieved very strongly. He started crying when he came to the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, after what Abu Dhar said. It's supposed to be his brother in Islam. They fought in the Ghazwa together. You see, they were in the battle together. You see? Why is my brother doing me this way? And especially talking about his mother or his mother, you know, who, was a, who had been enslaved. He himself suffered some of the worst torture. Him and the, and the Sahabi Khabab suffered Khabab and Bilal where two of the companions suffered the worst torture in Mecca. Now he's in Medina here in racial slurs. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu asked Abu Dhar, he said, he said, yeah. He says, yeah, Abu Dhar, you are a man who has some of the jahiliyyah in you still. Some of the days of the, that predate Islam. So Abu Dhar went to Bilal and he laid down the ground off for Bilal to take his foot and step like right here on his neck and face as atonement. And we know amongst the Arab culture what it means to be lowered in someone's foot. To be underneath someone's foot. We know what that means. You see? But Bilal didn't do that. He didn't step on it. So what are, the, what are one of the lessons in this that I'm mentioning? That when the Prophet وسلم, heard about this, he corrected Abu Dhar, and he corrected Abu Dhar publicly. Why did he correct Abu Dhar publicly? 
because there was an injustice done, but also to make Bilal feel safe, that he had a safe space in the community. And that there was a public injustice done, and a public injustice is discussed and addressed publicly, not in private. And it was done immediately. There's a saying about justice delayed is justice denied. He did it immediately. The Prophet addressed it quickly. And then Abu Dhar, when he recognized his wrong, he tried to make atonement to right the wrong. And that's what justice is about in Islam. It's restorative in nature. Adala means justice in Arabic. al adal is one of Allah's names. He is the just. Allah is the one that put everything in its proper place, in its right balance. And when people try to take things out of the place that Allah intended them to be in, this is vulnerable. This is what oppression means, according to Syria. So we got to make things right. So when we see people being racist, we're not supposed to let it slide. This is part of what's called al amru bil ma'roof wa nahya munkar. It's part of our aqidah in Islam. Enjoying what is right and forbidding what is wrong. Now, of course, we're supposed to do it in the best ways, and not, we're not supposed to be harsh in the way we correct people. We're supposed to say, uh, Ammo, auntie, friend, mom, dad. You know, we're to, we do it in, in the best way. We're supposed to do it. We're supposed to, when we see an injustice, we're supposed to address it. And we know that the, the authentic hadith narrated by a Muslim. If any of you see a moon car, you what? You try to change it what? Be yadi. With the hand. You can't change it with the hand. Resist. Be lisani. Speak out against it. If you're just feeling bad about it, you know, the, the Prophet, alayhi salam, said, so you just feel bad about it in your heart. But that is the awful iman. That's the weakest of faith. So we're not supposed to strive to be the weakest in anything. We're supposed to strive for excellence as Muslims. We're not supposed to strive for the lowest, like, denominator. That's not what, that's not what being a mu'min is about, or a mu'min. Okay, so we challenge these things publicly. The second thing is we cultivate brotherhood, like how the Sahaba cultivated brotherhood when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam started the sisterhood and brotherhood compact in Medina. One of the first things he did, he paired off primarily a muhajir, an immigrant, with an ansari, one of the helpers. Like Bilal was made a brother with Abdul Rahman ibn, ibn Al. Excuse me. Bilal made a brother with Abu Dardat. So Bilal, black, used to be a slave, immigrant to Medina. Abu Dardat, Medini, he was from Medina, Arab, and he was a businessman. In other words, he had produce, he had loot. He wasn't broke. So there were, there were brotherhoods and sisterhoods made, not even just across racial lines, but also socioeconomic lines. And many times in our community, as in most societies, there is a connection between racism and classism. You, you can't really separate them too much. There's a connection. So there's all these relationships, you know. Zayd bin Haritha was made a brother, best friend with Amur Rasulillah, Hamza, who was from Quraysh. Zayd was an ex-slave, you see? So this, these are the types of relationships that were made across tribal lines and ethnic lines. And we should be trying to cultivate these amongst ourselves. That we should try to strive to have a friend and try to make friends with someone and keep a regular contact, try to see them once a month, contact once a week over the phone, email or something with someone who's outside of our ethnic group and our socioeconomic group. We should try to seek this out. This is a lost sunnah. This is a lost sunnah amongst the Muslims. And in our youth groups, in the masajid, if any of you are youth leaders in your, in your masajid or youth groups, that try to cultivate this amongst the younger people. Because how we stop this ignorance of racism, and we have to address it at young ages. We start addressing it with fourth graders and fifth graders and these young ages. 
Because by the time most of us get to college, we're, we may be too far Jack Lee. You know? Really. Uh, the fifth thing is we need more education and community discussions about these issues. This can't be we have one form of one discussion and people leave, oh, we talked about our racism issue solved, or we speak in slogans, Islam is against racism. Like, you know how we go to the non-Muslims with the terrorists say, oh, Islam is peace. The cliches don't solve anything. We need regular conversation. You know, about the Jum'ah, we have about the Jum'ah every week. Kupat al-Jum'ah is not a class. Kupat al-Jum'ah is a remembrance. So we have to be reminded constantly. The Quran calls the Friday sermon vicar. It's a remembrance. We have to constantly be reminded. Ya ayyuhal bi amanu idha nudi ala sunnata min yawm al-Jum'ah fasar ila dhikru Allahi wa dhuru bayh. That's the ayat of the Quran. All those who believe, when the adhan is called, the call of prayer is made for the Jum'ah day, for the khutbah, Hasten the remembrance of Allah and leave off all business. See, leave off all business. So we need constant discussions. And again, these discussions need to start at a young age. Need to start at a young age. Because even some of the young people, unfortunately, they get into this thing where they start describing someone or describing each other as oh, such and such is pretty because she's fair, or my skin's darker. Like, we, our, our youth and young people internalize a lot of things they hear from older people. You see? So we have to be, we have to be careful about this. And the last thing before I close is that we amongst ourselves in our community should not close the door to intertribal or interracial marriage. This is one thing that we forget about that actually brought the companions closer together too. Starting with the Prophet himself and his family. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. He married women of different tribes. You know, and, and the culture at the time, when you marry, see, the Adams used to fight and kill each other based upon tribe in the Hijaz. But once they married into a tribe, each other like it became one family. So he married amongst the different tribes, right? Then, I mean, a couple of his wives weren't even out of Maria al Tabtiya, Umm Mini, Maria al Tabtiya, Rabbullah Anha, was not an Arab. She is from Egypt. Egyptians were not Arabs 1,400 years ago. Islam spread into Egypt and Arabized North Africans. Like the majority of people in Bilal al Sham weren't Arabs either. Islam spread at the time of Rabbi al Khattab and Arabized people in Philistine and, 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 and Syria. They had a different language. They had some different cultural things. Islam Arabized the people of Morocco. A Muslim. The Swahili language came through the Arabization of East Africa. Arab men were traders and had children and married indigenous women that started a whole new culture. Swahili, key Swahili. Like from the coast, that's what it means, Swahili. You see? But this started off with our Prophet He arranged every, basically every male companion that was not Arab, married an Arab woman. Salman al Farsi, Salman the Persian, married a woman from Bani Kinda, with origins from Yemen. This was one of the baller tribes. She had money. You know, some men used to be an ex-slave, so he didn't have any money either. Bilal married a woman from Bani Bukair, and he married Hala, the sister of Abu Rahman ibn Auf. And Abu Rahman ibn Auf was the Bill Gates of the Sahaba. He was the richest companion. You see? So, like, this, this is what Usama bin Zaid, his marriage was personally arranged by the Prophet وسلم, to Fatima bin Qais. And she was from Quraysh. Usama bin Zayd was black. He was the last general 
amongst the Sahaba in the, in the, in the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's a teenager too, by the way. He was a youth. He was younger than like all of y'all up in here right now, I, I would say. And he was given leadership, even over some of the, uh, of the kibar in the Sahaba. You know, over Khalid ibn Walid and Abu Bakr and Umar, like he was given that position. You see? So anyway, we shouldn't close the door on it and mock other people or close the possibility if you meet someone in university or somewhere that's of a different ethnic group, you should keep your mind open. There's nothing wrong about it. Now, the more similarities you marry someone, the better. But kuf, or compatibility with Islam, is first based upon a deen. Our Prophet وسلم, he gave two pieces of advice. One for the men who were looking for marriage, in conclusion, and then one for the wali of the sisters or the father. I'll give both of these. Both of these are authentic. Authentic traditions. They are both uh, uh, authentic. They're sahihain. They're both authentic. So he told brothers, brothers, he told you to look for four things. You can check out a sister for marriage, for her, her wealth, or her, her property. She's be her, her beauty, because you have to marry someone you think looks cute. Her lineage and her deen. But he said you're supposed to stick to deen, and deen is primary. You stick to that first. All that other stuff is secondary. He told the men with their daughters, if a man comes to marry with a deen wa khulat, only two things for the girls, primarily. At deen wa khulat, he has deen and he has good character. Do not hesitate to marry him or else el fitna will spread in the land. Fitna. And subhanAllah, we have fitna in the Muslim community today. The relationship to marriage. I, I get calls about these issues, by the way. Uh, relating to this, this, this one particular uh, inter-ethnic, interracial marriage uh, issue. Even sometimes I get into the village. I had to intercede in the issue last year where the parents didn't want their daughter, they're engaged now, alhamdulillah, but the girl's family was from Gaza and the, and the boy's family was from Beit Hanina in the West Bank and they were trying to block the marriage because they're from a different part of Palestine. They're both occupied. <laughs> Both Muslims, you know, like what does that have to do with anything? Both born and raised here, neither one of them live in full steam. And one's trying to block the other, oh yeah, we all like those men from Beta Hanina. Homie never even lived in Beta Hanina. <laughs> you see? But he's been as Habu Fajr, praise Fajr in the Mecca, that's what's important, you praise Fajr. How many brothers, how many brothers these days who are in their 20s are going praying Fajr and Jamaah every morning? Not too many. You see? He's mujahid right there. Anyway, there, alhamdulillah, inshallah, they have a happy marriage. But my point is, this is how deep, like the 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 the, 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 the al asabiyah that we have amongst the Muslims where stuff like this happens. Especially with fellow Muslims. This should be our number one priority outside of our ibadah, or our salah. And I have the Jaleel for this. There's two different narrations. Our Prophet وسلم, only made hajj one time. Only made hajj one time. When he went to the Kaaba, they were going to make tawaf in front of the Sahaba. He looked over at the Kaaba and he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, El Mu'min, Adum, Hurmatim al Kaaba. He said, The believer is more important and more precious with Allah than the Kaaba. Now, we face 
the Kaaba minimum five times a day in prayer. This is a source of unification, is our tibla, and recognition of one God. We face that tibla no matter where we're at. What's the deeper meaning of what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam was telling us? That outside of your ritual worship, the importance that you give that Kaaba, your brother and sister Islam deserves more of your attention than that Kaaba. That's what he's saying. I know many of us have a picture of the Kaaba in our homes or our masajid. And if someone went to go to destroy the Kaaba, brothers and sisters, especially brothers, be ready to get an airplane ticket and try to find any way they could to Mecca to defend the Kaaba. But what about defending the honor and the dignity of your brother and sister right in front of your face? What about the brother and sister who doesn't look like you? What about their dignity? What about their honor? It should be a priority. SubhanAllah. I was so sad early this year, I have to say this. This is, this is a lesson about how we need to be, sometimes we don't do certain things because we don't know. Other times, we don't do things because we really don't see equal importance between groups of people. What took place earlier this year in Gaza? Musiba Kabir. It's horrible. And we know what took place in that occupation. Early this year, in a country called the Central African Republic, 189,000 Muslims were driven out of the capital. There were mass murder of Muslims, mass rape, massaged burned. I didn't hear one protest from American Muslims about that. 24 times Muslims got killed in Central Africa Republic in Gaza by the Zionists. No Muslim organizations had any campaigns. No dua kanut, no dua nazila in the massaged. We should be ashamed. Because, and, and people knew about it. It was being tweeted, it was on Al Jazeera. Many people knew, community leaders, and I even discussed it some. But there were main one action alerts and protests all around about Gaza. Because it seems to be like we value certain Muslim lives more than others, depending on where they come from and how they look. That's nifaq. It's hypocrisy. Look, when we see these things as individuals, we are the ones that need to raise these issues and discuss these things amongst our Muslim organizations and our families for that matter. When we see these types of things. Well, when this was going on, I mentioned this to some people. I noticed in my office, I literally cried one day about this. Yeah, that's definitely something we all need to reflect on, especially with the, like the causes that we choose to support. Um, another question that is was on uh, with the hashtag. So the people here are the people who recognize the community's racism. So how can we work with those who aren't here in the future? The Prophet said in his farewell sermon in one of the narrations, those who are a witness tell those who are absent, perhaps they may understand better than you. 
Those who are a witness, tell those who are not a witness, perhaps they will better understand than you. So my suggestion is, is that within your circle of influence, all of us should have friends or family within our circle of influence. I suggest firstly why this topic is fresh in your minds to sit down and start a conversation and discuss this issue with some of your friends. When you have time tomorrow or this weekend, you could even discuss it with your families. That's number one. And that's one of the main things. Number two, you know there's a saying in our, in our society in America that charity starts at home. Sometimes some of the most work we need, some of the most conversations we need are inside our own households with our mothers and fathers, our uncles and aunties, brothers and sisters, and cousins. And though that's what takes what I what is called courageous conversations. Yeah, you have an amanu ku and fusakum wahikum nara. It's a command of Quran. All those you believe, save yourselves and your family from the fire. Your first obligation after trying to reform yourself is to have these conversations and discuss these things not just in your amongst your friends, but bring these issues up within your own family. Now I'm talking about the microaggressive issues. Well, who's in microaggression? Because everyone says, oh, there's no racism in Islam. Everyone says that, right? Okay, of course there's no racism in Islam. Muslims, are, Muslims can be racist, right? So that, that's, that's why I suggest. We have a, a written question from the audience. So it says, you mentioned four large problems in the community at the start of the talk. Could you speak about the other three briefly? I can't even do justice to those other three. Um, I mentioned racism. I mentioned misogyny or sexism in terms of how we have half of our community voice Silence to not given deference to, where our sisters are marginalized, uh, and there's all sorts of microaggression uh, that takes place against them, including uh, brothers. You, if it's not someone in your family, you have no business telling a sister how she should dress. You have no business. Lower your gaze. That's what the Quran says. The Quran doesn't say check your sister about her dress. It says lower your gaze. If you have a problem, it's your problem. Classism. Classism, there's a connection with racism, but, but also sometimes it's not. But there is an overlap. But when we have certain communities or suburban communities not interacting with other parts of this community who are so-called urban, and even how we talk sometimes is very classist. Like when we want to talk about our community, oh, we're the most educated community in America. We have so many professionals. Well, I mean, what's wrong with the brother who works or owns a gas station or a captain or a taxi cab driver? He's somehow less of a Muslim or he somehow shouldn't be held up as a good American just because he's not a medical doctor or engineer? What's wrong with us? The Sahaba didn't have a big suburb that kept so far away and didn't interact with the rich Sahaba with those who didn't have as much. You know, Abu Dhar, you know, see, Abu Dhar and Medet the last you know, they lived close by to each other. You know, Abu Dhar wasn't over in Beverly Hills and Medina, and El Medad was over in Compton. You see? And then the last one is sectarianism. Uh, where the Quran clearly says, will be coming like each and will have to follow. Hold on tight to all of you to God's rope and don't divide yourselves. All Muslims say they follow the Quran and Sunnah. Is there one agreed upon Sunnah? Nope. To Maliki, Sunnah is praying with hands to the side. This is the strongest opinion. And there's Hadith and Dalil. 
Or one group say, oh, we're in, we're tablighi jama'at, jama'at al tabliq, and then, you know, then the Salafis talk to tablighis, and then someone's in this tariqah, or they say, oh, you know, my shaykh, this silsila is better than your shaykh, and all this old type of stuff. You know, and then we forget about the focus, which Allah says, on type of rope of Allah, the Prophet, alayhi sallam, tells what the rope is. The rope of Allah is the book of Allah, is the Quran that extends from the heaven down to the earth. Meaning that the Quran connects us to our spiritual and intellectual lives as well as our physical, social lives. That's what that's what that's what that's, that's talking about. And that should be our point of unity because Muslims overall do not disagree on the basic halal, haram, and the basal eth the basic ethical teachings that are in the Quran. And that's our point of unity. All this stuff about Sunni, Shi'i, and we can't get with them, or he's Shadali, and not Shabandi, and all this old type of stuff. That's a problem in our community. Respectfully address our parents and slash elders when you see them showing racism and racist answers. Okay, sorry. Okay, so there's a saying attributed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but it's it's cut, meaning there's no isnad. What we can say it's a general saying of the Allah. Or uh, a saying of uh, hikmah, wisdom. And the saying goes, teaching a young person is like etching into stone. But teaching an elder is like writing on the face of the water. Meaning that when a person gets to be a certain age, for the most part, their worldview is set. It's very hard for a person who gets to be like 50-something years old, 60, that they're going to change, even my age, like 40. Most people, after they get to be 40 years old, their worldview is set for the most part, right? So it's very difficult and very hard. But my suggestion is, is that you address your uh, your parents if they're saying something ra racist in a very uh, respectful way. Don't raise your voice. Have good manners. Give them advice and examples based upon the Quran and the teachings and the, and the things that are authentic. From the Prophet Now, the Quran is the best preaching. It's it is al muridatul hasana. It's the best preaching, right? So, like, if your parents don't respond to the Quran, and like, don't think that you really can come up with too much more that's intellectual that's going to sway them to the Quran. In al asr al-Hadith Kitab Allah, right? The truest words, the best words, our Prophet said, alayhi salam is a Quran. Right? So I mean, that's 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 you know, but be respectful and say it, but you know it's hard for people when they have stereotypes and generalizations that they've held their whole lives to let that go. It's very difficult. Because many times our elders review those stereotypes or generalizations as part of their identity. So even when you're correcting them on their racism, they can see it as you challenging something that they find fundamental to their identity. You know, and that's difficult. Like it's hard for people to like give up their, 
give up give up those things. Like it's it's it's, it's difficult. I, I've talked to people about about this. And, and what's the the hardest issue about this is really for parents. It really comes down to the issue of marriage. Really. That's the biggest one. That's the biggest one. Especially for our, for our, our, our daughters, because we're a hypocrite. We're a hypocrite when it comes to our girls, because we let the boys go out and miss they marry any old body. You know, it's, it's, it's the girls that we have to like, keep a tighter leash on. You know, well, some brother. I have a little daughter, inshallah, I don't do that with her. But, um, yeah, that's my advice regarding that. I just wanted to add a little something as an elder, and one thing that I find very um, moving, even with my children and grandchildren, is when they don't agree with me, they don't argue, they state how they feel, and they move themselves into another area. And that kind of makes me, you know, they're not going to argue, they're very polite, well, you know, and I don't, I don't agree with that, I mean, they won't. And at least for me to approach them and say, why don't you agree? And they'll they'll draw themselves to me like that rather than trying to argue with us. Just remove yourself. Every time that happens consistently, remove yourself from the air. That's just a suggestion. Sure. So uh, another question we had is, uh, how can you use the media as a means to uh, combat racism? Well, in that question, I, I'm assuming uh, since most of us don't have access to uh, mainstream media or to even our community newspapers, so we could write to our community newspapers, I think Part of the best is uh, social media, of how we can address these things. So one is that when we're having these discussions, we should periodically like tweet out information, put it on Facebook. If we have blogs, we should blog about it. Maybe we can bring up or pick one of the companions, what male and female companions, or write something about them and their lives and how there was an issue that was dealt with and overcame, and I can give you references for many of these, from especially Salman, Salman and Bilal, uh, Um Ayman too, um, also as Baraka, um, who was an Ethiopian woman, but there's, there's numbers of ones that we can use. And, you know, there's always a saying about a picture speaks a, th a, speaks a thousand words. Well, Maybe YouTube speaks 10,000 words. So, uh, some of you may be creative. Like, you know, right now at CARE Michigan, we're doing uh, I Know Your Rights video, but instead of the dry Know Your Rights video that we give, say, okay, if the, if the FBI comes, you don't have to open your door, you have the right to remain silent, blah, 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 blah. We now have a video we're making where it's interactive. We have people role playing. Right? It's like you may have seen that video about that role playing about the, uh, the profiling in New York where the, they fake like the, the guys were walking with like clothes like this and the police officer just, huh, 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 then when the two bros had a throw and they all got thrown up against the wall, right? Sometimes to show how ignorant racism is, if you had a type of role playing type of situation for some of you who are media savvy and a little creative, you can do role playing of some of these issues, but you can kind of like semi like mock them either, like the roles. You could be like, Baba, I met this nice brother at university. Yeah, yeah, he's in, he's starting to be a doctor. Yeah, what's his name? Tyrone Muhammad. <laughs> like that? <laughs> <laughs> that, that, would, that would teach a lesson, you know, you know what I'm saying? That'd be funny, right? So uh, those are just some suggestions of how you could use uh, media and show them.
So, um, relative to our MSA, um, it's been more historically Daisy and uh, Arab. So, what can we do to make it more inclusive, uh, more inclusive community? Steps that we can take. I have a couple of suggestions. Um, you know, once certain ideas are really entrenched, it's really hard for people to move past them. And I know of black American students, who I knew personally who went to Michigan State who never attended the MSA because they said the MSA was not for them. They're practicing Muslims. They, they would go to the Black Student Union, and during Black History Month, they would do the Malcolm X event you know, with, with the Black Student Union, not even with the MSA. Um, so I mean, it takes time and outreach, putting out flyers. If you know people who are Muslim, who are black, to like, uh, like proactively, like really try to invite them at the beginning of the semester. But also, once they come, have let them have a voice and you sit down in the beginning of the semester, I'm sure you do, but be very purposeful about it as far as like what topics and initiatives like you want to deal with for a semester or for a year as an MSA, and I'm sure you do it already. But we have a lot of pseudo-unity in the Muslim community. We have a lot of pseudo-unity. And what it means is we have organizations and we invite people under the name of unity, but it's a preset agenda. That's not unity. So I'll give an example that I use as way to food. I'll give an example. So this, this uncle with this organization a few years ago, it's in Hyderabad. I'm using a food analogy. So Hyderabad is important, important right here for this conversation. So he's like, you know, we want to have this organization, uh, and you know, he knows I know like all the different massages in Detroit. So he wanted me to get like the Nigerian brothers and Senegalese, and like the Bosnians, Albanians. He said, you're going to have these brothers come, and we want to invite, you know, them to come for the unity because we want them to do, you know, we we do this, this, and this. And I said, I said, uncle, I said, that's not unity, inviting someone to a preset agenda. Everyone needs input. So I said, let's look at as food, if we want to look at unity. Don't invite everyone to the table and every time they come, you want to feed them biryani, Hyderabad style. I said, no, you bring biryani, I'm going to bring some macaroni and cheese, the Nigerian brothers will bring some fufu, the Egyptian brothers going to bring mulakia, you know, the, uh, the, the, the Bosnian is going to bring their type of kebab, it'll stuff peppers, you know what I mean? And everyone's going to bring their food together and put it on the table, and then we get our plate, and we all partake in each other's food. That's unity. Unity's not eating biryani every time. So I'm equating food with the MSA agenda. So yeah, if, if, if black people were coming, like black people like to eat biryani and makhlubah. Right? But like they want to eat something else too. Like we all need to have something else, right? It just can't be very honey and mechalum. And you, you all get my point, right? And I love makaluba and biryani. I'm just using those as examples. Okay, so next question. Intra-Muslim racism first hurts us spiritually. It hurts our collective psyche. Because we doing that, if we are immersed in tribalism and racism, then we cannot fulfill our description in the Quran. In the Hadihi Umatikum Umatin Wahida Rakukum Fabudum. See we're not we're not living what real ummah is. And then the Quran says, Kuntu khayru ummah al ukhridat the nas, ta'un bu ma'roof, wa tuhana al munkar, wa tuhminu bilah. See, we're supposed to be the best nation for people. That we enjoy what is good and just. 
We forbid the injustice and indecency, and we believe in one's God. So we're not living Oma from a spiritual perspective. Number two, we all know that racism against different Muslim groups, Arabs and South Asians, and Islamophobia in general is a real growing problem in America, especially with all this Daesh and ISIS stuff going on. It's the worst I've ever seen it in the media since 9-11. It's the worst. It's the worst right now. Okay? But how can we Muslims have the moral authority to complain about the American people who aren't Muslim discriminating against, each, against us when we have so much racism and discriminate against each other? See, we don't have moral authority. See, this is called nifaq. Again, I just turned again. It's hypocrisy. And Allah does not help hypocrites. You see, so we have to, we have to, our Rasulullah sallallahu said, sharran nas the wajhain. The most evil of the people have two faces. You see? The, the other thing is, from a social political perspective, we only make up 2% of the population. I say this, it, there's one community you can compare us to in America, as far as percentage, is a religious minority, Jewish Americans. Jewish Americans make up 2% of the population, roughly. We make up 2% of the population. American Muslims per capita make about the same amount of money per year as Jewish Americans. We're like the two most wealthy groups of people in America per capita. American Muslims and Jewish Americans. American Muslims are divided based upon tribe and ethnicity. Jews have their divisions too, but they have more solidarity. So they're able to exert more political power. We lack political power because we're so divided. We have the Albanian masjid, the Bosnian masjid, we have the Bengalis over here, and, and, and the Hyderabadis here, and then in, you know, in Jirwa, we have the Philistine masjid, the Yemeni masjid, the Libnani masjid, the Iraqi masjid. So how are we going to come together to fight against Islamophobia, work for more social equality against poverty? How are we going to help free Palestine when we're, we're so divided? You see, there is no Zionist occupation of Palestine without support of America. You all realize that, right? How many billions of dollars a year we give them? So we American Muslims have a greater responsibility than any other Muslims in the Ummah regarding Palestine. We don't even see it that way. Like, we have power that we're supposed to be exerting. Like, we're going to be held to a, a, a very big task on Yom Hisab that Allah Azawajal blessed us with this diversity of thought, of, of knowledge, blessed us to be the most educated Muslim community in the world, blessed us with this wealth, and then we're being racist against each other in this country that is supporting illegal Zionist occupation and we're not doing anything real about it? Or helping Syria, all these other issues? You see? That's why fighting racism in the community is important. There are Muslims abroad who are dying due to our disunity. Literally. How do we hold ourselves accountable, our own personal selves? I mentioned in Muhasibah, a self-reflection that the prophets did in the Quran. And there's some dua that we should learn when we find ourselves thinking racist thoughts before we even do the actions. There's some dua that we should say. You know, if you read the Quran and a mistake that Musa salam, did, he said, Rabbi in need the lump to nafsi for He made a confession. My Lord, most certainly I have oppressed my own soul, so forgive me. See, we have to understand 
that racism has two faces of vulnerable or oppression. See, when we're racist, we do harm to other people, but firstly, we harm ourselves. Like we're committing sin, like we're, we're, we are committing harm and oppressing our own souls when we oppress fellow brothers and sisters with our racism. See, we think we're just hurting other people. We, we hurt ourselves when we hurt other people. Nabi Yunus alayhi salam, another dua. When he made his mistake and got into the belly of the fish, La ilaha subhanaka inni kuntum min al See, this is a confession. There's no God but you, O Allah. Glory be to you. And surely I'm from the oppressors. The oppressors of who? Nabi Yunus alayhi salam didn't oppress any, any men. He oppressed himself. Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the most, one of the most beautiful hadith of Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rabbi inni dhalamtu nasi dhuman kathira. وَلَا يَغْفِرُ الْذُنُوبَ إِلَّا أَنْتْ فَقَفْرُ لِي مَغْفِرَةً مِنْ إِنْدِكْ مِنْ إِنْدِكْ وَرْحَمْنِي إِنْدِكَ أَنْتَ غَفُورُ الرَّحِيمِ O Allah, most certainly I have oppressed my own soul with much oppression. He did the same, there's the same spirit of dua that Musa alayhi salam and Yunus alayhi salam did, but he is stronger. Allahumma inni dhulamtu nafsi dhulman kafira. And there are none who can forgive sins except for you, so please forgive me. See, so when we recognize this, we have to do this sincere dua, turn our hearts to Allah and understand that when we are perpetuating racism and doing these things to other people, that we are, we are killing our hearts. We are killing our hearts. We are taking ourselves away from the sunnah of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And how are we going to be on the day of resurrection when we have to face our Lord? And then we are facing our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You see? That's, that's, my, that's my answer. Again, it all goes back to spirituality, dear brothers and sisters. Everything starts, everything starts and ends in the heart. You see? So that's, that's it. Is this over? <laughs> حارك الله نور بحمدك شدوا إن لا إن لا أنت نصبرك ونتوب إليك بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وأصلي إن الإنسان لا في خصر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصبيحات متواصل بالحق متواصل السلام عليكم